CNN Student News. I'm Carl Azuz. The U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee says a terrorist attack on Americans in Libya could have been prevented. Here's the background on that. September 11th, 2012, the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya was attacked and burned. Four Americans were killed, including an ambassador named Chris Stevens. A bipartisan Senate committee just released a report that says there were warnings that security at the American compound was weakening and that Americans were at risk. It blames the U.S. State Department and the CIA for not doing enough to protect Americans there. But it also said there was no specific threat that an attack was going to happen. The Obama administration initially said the attack was a reaction to an anti-Muslim film made in the U.S. It later reclassified the incident as a terrorist attack. In response to the Senate report, the State Department says it's taken steps to increase security for American diplomats overseas and that it's working to minimize the risks they face. On Libya's eastern border, Egypt, the country had a revolution in 2011 when its longtime leader Hosni Mubarak resigned after widespread riots. Since then, though, Egypt has struggled to get back on its feet politically. The military took control last summer. And the new constitution that Egyptians are currently voting on would give the military more power. Are the elections fair? A long, long line outside this polling station as Egyptians vote in a constitutional referendum. But more is at stake than just a new social contract. The interim government's legitimacy too is on the line. The country is voting for the first time since last July when the military ousted former Muslim Brotherhood leader Mohamed Morsi from the presidency. Since then, a bitterly divided Egypt has seen hundreds die in clashes between security forces and Morsi supporters. It's a crucial vote. A strong yes turnout would translate into support for General Abdel Fattah Assisi, the man behind the coup, and his interim government. Right now, the new regime is seeking popular support, and uh, if they get a uh, high turnout, if they get bigger numbers supporting uh, the draft constitution, I think they can claim from on now onwards uh, that uh, they do have uh, reasonable uh, popular support, uh, good enough uh, to make them go on with the rest of the roadmap. Those voting weren't shy to show their love for Egypt's top general and the constitution. Egypt's Muslims and Christians alongside the army are one hand and will never part, says this lawyer. Egyptians vote today to show they're completely against the former regime and they welcome the roadmap, says this student. Dissenting voices, on the other hand, have been quashed through intimidation and arrest. The scary part is that uh, opposition is no longer tolerated. Uh, I mean, even for uh, political parties. To the Southern Hemisphere now, where folks are in the midst of summer, and it's a doozy in parts of Australia. We're talking temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius. That's 104 degrees Fahrenheit. It's spiking to 115 in some places. Might be okay if you're at the pool, but on the court of the Australian Open, it's taking place in Melbourne on Australia's southeast coast, water bottles are melting. Tennis players are getting burned feet. One Canadian fainted during his opening match. The dangers of these hot, dry conditions are extending to where there's no tennis court or players in sight. A five-day record-breaking heat wave has left the southeast of Australia sweltering. Scorching temperatures as high as 46 degrees Celsius have been forecast for the next few days too, putting emergency services on high alert. In South Australia, more than 26,000 lightning strikes were recorded, sparking dozens of blazes that are still raging today. A fire at Rockley, an hour out of Adelaide, destroyed a home and left a woman in hospital with serious burns. Support aircraft from around the country have been sent to help fight the fires. Hot, dry and windy conditions are a big concern. We're going into an escalating pattern with increased winds over the next couple of days and fire safety is absolutely critical. In major cities, people are being told to brace for blackouts as the sustained use of air conditioners puts a strain on power companies. A change is expected to come through over the weekend and temperatures are predicted to drop by almost 20 degrees. But for now, everyone's trying to keep cool the best way they can. See if you can ID me. I'm a company that provides a service, an electronic one. If you want to get on the internet, you'll need me. Some of my well-known examples include AOL, Comcast, and Verizon. I'm an Internet Service Provider, or ISP. For a fee, I'll help you get online.
Once you pay that fee, usually a monthly one, your ISP lets you go wherever you want online. The Federal Communications Commission, part of the U.S. government, had a rule that said ISPs cannot discriminate against web content. That means they can't make some sites fast to encourage you to use them and some slow to keep you off them. The concept is called net neutrality, but a federal court has struck down the FCC's rule. It said the FCC didn't have the authority to make it. The FCC can rewrite its rules in the future. And for now, your internet experience isn't likely to change. But some are concerned how it could. Net neutrality means that every site on the internet should be equally accessible. No matter whether you're going to Amazon or YouTube or Facebook, your internet service provider is supposed to offer you free and equal access to all those sites. But Tuesday's ruling changes that. Uh, let's use video streaming services like YouTube and Netflix as an example. Uh, some worry that sites like YouTube could cut a deal with your internet service provider to allow you to access it faster and to slow access to other streaming sites like Netflix, but that's just one possibility. Net neutrality advocates say that this ruling could also allow internet service providers to slow everything and then charge you extra to allow faster access to a particular site like Amazon. If you don't like the sound of all this, well, Got some bad news for you. These net neutrality rules have never applied to mobile devices. Mobile internet providers in the U.S. do not have to provide free and equal access to everything on the net. Christy Lou Stout, CNN. Sticking with the internet theme here, internet company Google is getting more powerful by the day. Its latest purchase could give it greater access to your home. Nest is a brand of smart thermostat. It learns when and how you want your temperature adjusted. Google just bought that company in addition to a rapidly growing list of others. Why? So Google bought Nest, a company that makes thermostats and smoke detectors. For more than $3 billion. So why is Google interested in buying a company like that? Well, Google is trying to take over your connected life. Google in 2011 created Android, Android at Home, a platform that allows all of your connected devices to talk to one another. So that means that your connected oven running Android can talk to your smoke detector also running Android, so that when you have your oven at 500 degrees, it doesn't just automatically set your smoke alarm off there talking to one another. What Google is trying to do is to make all of the different things that you own. Lights, alarm clocks, thermostats, dishwashers, etc. To talk to one another. This isn't the first time that Google has gotten into something that seemingly is beyond the scope of search. They're involved in space mining, weather balloons, Google Glass, they're involved in robotics now, and they're even involved in driverless cars. But all of these things are part of Google trying to foresee where tech is going. The interesting thing with all of this is Google has to keep privacy in mind. Now, if Google really knows everything about you, well, then it has to do a really good job of protecting that information. Google's got to play it safe here, but if they play it smart, this is potentially a billion or multiple billion dollar opportunity for them. Some unique mascots take their place in today's roll call. We've got the Battle Mountain Longhorns, which sounds awesome. They're viewing us from Battle Mountain, Nevada. Over in Sand Springs, Oklahoma, check out the Sandites. They're tuning in from Clyde Boyd Middle School. Last but not least, we're saying hello to the Quakers, Salem High School in Salem, Ohio. Thanks y'all for watching. It's hard to beat a buzzer beater before we go, but this young man named Easton did it. A full court shot. It was captured on camera and posted on YouTube, and as you can see by the score, it won the game. But the story gets better. Later on, Easton was reenacting how he did it for a local news crew. On his first try, bam! Three more points posted on the news and on YouTube for the 13-year-old who's got to be one of the most famous 8th graders in Minnesota. News of this has been a bit of a globetrotter. It's spread north, south, east, and west. Of course, his accomplishment has netted a lot of attention, but two full court shots. The person who recorded them both times must have been a basket case. I'm Carl Zeus, and I'll take a shot at more puns tomorrow.